Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds and welcome to World Sepsis Day. So you're celebrating in your own way without sepsis. Um, so I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Alison Lally, who's one of our ED staff specialists and the chair of the ED Sepsis Committee yes. to <laughs> come and present today on the past future, past, present and future of sepsis management, I presume. Thank you. Thanks, Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So, I've hit the space, space bar. There we are. Great. I wish to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as traditional custodians of the ACT and recognise any other people or families with connections to the lands of the ACT and region. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution to the life of this region. So I'm here today to talk about sepsis. Um, very fitting that it's on World Sepsis Day. So thanks everyone for coming along. Just going to have a little bit of a chat first about um, sepsis and what's kind of been happening over the past probably 25 years. Um, discuss a case study, some strategies that we're doing in the Canberra Health Service ED um, to improve timely sepsis care, and where are we going to go moving forward. So sepsis is actually a medical emergency. So why does it not get the same attention and recognition as our trauma patients, STEMI patients, or stroke patients? I'm sure you've all been to resus and it, there's a flurry around our trauma patients. Our stroke patients get at least a nurse doctor and a stro stroke nurse, um, plus or minus the um, stroke fellow on call. Our STEMI patients have the cardiology. So why are we not giving this more attention? Usually it's an elderly person who's in our corridor who waits a long time for it to be recognised. So just to start, sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. And when we talk about septic shock, it's more about that being profound enough to substantially increase mortality. You'll see a lot of these definitions in a lot of the research articles. Um, and essentially, it's a sick person who's got signs of organ dysfunction. Um, and with our Canberra Health Services sepsis policy and procedure, we are defining sepsis, septic shock as blood pressure less than 90 and a lactate greater than 4. So you'll see that there has been a change from our lactate being greater than 2 to greater than 2 to 4. And that's a result of the um, ARISE study. That's what they um, based their septic shock parameters on. So a little bit about sepsis in Australia. As you can see, there's a lot of number ones there. So um, today is really a day to increase that awareness. So it's the number one cause of deaths in hospital in Australia. It's the number one cause of healthcare costs, which is uh, very uh, appropriate at the moment. A big thing globally, which is quite scary, this one is that it's 40% occur in children under the age of five. Thankfully, in our area, it's not as bad as that, but almost heartbreaking that. Um, a lot of children under the age of five are, are getting sepsis. As we can see in Australia, it costs over $1.5 billion every year. So I thought I'd start with um, a very typical uh, ED patient. A 71-year-old gentleman arrives during a, the lunchtime rush. Um, he presents with increasing wheeze at night. There's been no fever, but he's noted to have a cough at triage. He's afebrile, uh, no increasing oxygen requirement noted, um, and his heart rate's 113 with a history of AF and stroke. He's got complex medical conditions and multiple medications. Um, the history is reduced intake with some lethargy, some intermittent confusion for the past three days. He's had an ongoing cough with exertional dyspnea and a recent endoscopy for his chronic liver disease 10 days prior. He's known to be slightly drowsy in bed. He's got mildly increased work of breathing, some crepitations at the bases, mild pitting edema. Um, he's got residual right arm weakness post, um, post a stroke that happened six months earlier. So looking at this, we get most of our information on history and exam from a patient. I'll just get you to pause a minute and think what, what's the most likely cause for this patient. And usually, X-rays happen pretty quick, but bloods take a bit longer. But this was the initial workup, which included a chest X-ray um, and initial bloods. With new DHIR, white cell count comes back really quickly, which is fantastic. Um, so slightly raised white cell count. And what we can see here is that there is a component of renal impairment, which is new. The creatinine 208, um, EGFR 27, and the urea, as you can see, is 23.7. And the X-ray is suggestive of pulmonary edema. So very common to actually go, right, this guy's got a bit of heart failure. Let's do some diuresis and talk to AME now that they take everyone. 
So thank you. Okay. So I'll just take a pause there. When I started looking a bit closer into sepsis, I got very overwhelmed by all the acronyms and way too many alphabets and way too much about vitamin C as well, but it's really confusing out there. And I think one thing to take away from today is that there's stacks of research and a lot of the fundamentals of sepsis care is much the same. So this is where it all began. Uh, so that's where the, the past, modern past of sepsis care comes into it from my perspective, um, is that Dr. Rivers was an ED physician out of Detroit who noticed that there was significant mortality um, when they did an observational study in their ED where they had a mortality rate between 40 and 60% of their septic patients. That is crazy. And so what they did in order to improve this was actually really focus on doing some um, uh, early goal-directed therapy. And that was where they really focused on optimization of the hemodynamics for oxygen delivery. So they used things like a map, so with a arterial line, um, central venous pressure, so they put an art line, um, sorry, central line in to look at the CVP, and also did the mixed oxygen levels. They went quite extreme, but they did notice a huge mortality benefit of 16%. So a lot of these things that came out of the Rivers trial was implemented into the um, the um, surviving sepsis campaign, which started in 2001. People went, wow, this is a uh, pretty high mortality to begin with, but you know, there was some improvement and actually some awareness of sepsis and how it can be improved in the ED. So three really big studies that were then subsequently done to actually look at early goal-directed therapy um, versus usual resuscitation. Now, this was done about 10 years later. So I think it's really hard to kind of standardize the usual resuscitation and ignore just our septic patients, knowing that there has been some research out there to show that blood pressure control antibiotics um, has improved uh, care. So the big one, which some of you might remember was the ARISE, which we actually participated here at this organization. I remember lactate greater than four, you enroll someone and get a coffee. So that was a really good strategy. Um, and essentially it took people uh, who they're worried about septic, uh, sepsis and septic shock. They were given antibiotics in up to 1.5 to two liters prior to enrollment. And they compared um, the usual resuscitation versus end goal directed therapy. And what we can see here is the, at the very end um, is the rivers, oh, sorry, the pointy thing, sorry. At the end here, this is essentially the rivers trial. What we can see is the mortality rate is way too high to begin with. In Australia, and uh, it also included New Zealand and Hong Kong and Ireland, we can see actually that the mortality is much less than the population in the States. Um, but there has been huge improvements, but not much difference between in, um, in goal directed therapy and usual resuscitation. The only problem is uh, complications that can come with unnecessary invasive procedures like central lines and also blood transfusions. Talking a bit about the surviving sepsis guidelines. So there's about 30 points to this guideline. I'm not gonna go through it all. I'm just gonna highlight some of the really important facts um, that we need to all work together to improve in our organization. So one is screening tools. Screening tools are recommended by the um, surviving sepsis guidelines. They are to help identify those acutely ill, high-risk patients. Some days we get up to 20 or 30 patients arriving in our ED in an hour. The triage nurses have three minutes. We cannot expect them in that time to be able to figure out what is completely wrong with all these patients and appropriately triage them. They do a phenomenal job. So screening tools actually help with that recognition. It's really important screening tools have the ability to opt out and not do that constant, okay, it's sepsis, therefore we're gonna go down this pathway. And in the States, they certainly measure a lot of their metrics on um, compliance to that. Um, we aren't going to incorporate that here, just more we need that sepsis screening tool. Um, QSOFA is mentioned quite a lot. Now that is not a screening tool. Um, it is more of a mortality predictor and that has also been reaffirmed in the latest guidelines from um, 2021. So we use here MUSE and PUSE um, or the early warning system. And for those suspected of having sepsis, we suggest measuring a blood lactate. This is something that we do do, not all the time. And we also have to be mindful that we're not using our lactate as a in or out a screening tool because there are people that have an ischemic bowel with a normal lactate. Um, so it's just mindful that we use our clinical um, gestalt as well. So talking about initial resuscitation, the guidelines recommend treatment and resuscitation begin immediately. And this is really important, similar to someone who's having a STEMI, similar to someone who's having a stroke, we need to start our resuscitation immediately. This is a big controversial issue about the amount of fluids. So 30 mils per kilo of IV crystalloid fluid is recommended for sepsis-induced hypoperfusion. And that's within the first three hours. 
I've got to say there's probably less push for that target and more people do 20 mils per kilo. And also there has been a greater push that we actually don't give as much fluid um, as what has been given. Um, this was based on best practice. There was no study comparing the 30 mils per kilo. It's also important to use dynamic measures to guide fluid resuscitation. Now, AMU have an ultrasound now, so they might be able to use it, but in our ED, ICU, POCUS, or point of care ultrasound is a really good tool to use for monitoring particular lungs. So if you start to notice some fluid in the lungs, then you should really stop. Um, the, uh, we also need to, if we've got to raise lactate, use that as our marker to make sure that we're improving. And if the lactate is rising, then we need to reassess and see what else is going on. One thing that's really important is clinical exam is still fundamental to our patient assessment and reassessment over time because the cap refill time can also be used um, to ensure that we're doing appropriate resuscitation on our patients. So infection, this still um, is fundamental to sepsis treatment. So for septic shock, antibiotics need to be given within an hour of recognition of septic shock. And this is something that we as an organisation are really going to start doing markers on with DHR makes a lot easier. And for those with sepsis, it's within three hours. It's really important we use appropriate antibiotics um, and we, based on whether there's a source identified or no source identified, appropriate de-escalation, which I know ID do very well on the ward within 24, 48 hours. And we also need to see if they've got risk of MRSA or um, an MRO. And usually with DHR now with the storyboard, that's actually really good. It's also recommended to administer antibiotics if there's been unexplained hypotension um, in a patient. And also really important to search for a source. Um, a CT abdopelvis is recommended for those where you can't see it in um, chest or urine. Um, and also really need to consider if there is a concern for infective endocarditis, we do our three sets of cultures. Otherwise ID will get a bit upset with us. Um, and source control is really important within six to 12 hours. I actually think this should be changed to ASAP because if someone's gotten infected, for example, central line, that should be removed straight away. If someone's got an infected stone, um, that needs to be removed. So we need to do it within six to 12, I think as soon as possible. So fluids and sepsis, there has been a lot of discussion around liberal versus restrictive. A lot of these are mainly in the ICU, um, talking about how much fluids is too much. Um, recent study, the Clover trial, um, those results came out earlier this year and it really showed no significant change in mortality before discharge home. But their liberal use was quite restrictive where it was four litres over five days um, and the restrictive was even less. So uh, I wouldn't call that liberal fluids, but there's really been no change and really there's no harm uh, was probably the biggest thing. The sensor trial showed that early vasopressors improved shock control by six hours. So there's huge with that because when we're thinking about length of stay in the ICU and length of stay in the ED, um, six hours is actually quite a long time. So that's where we start um, vasopressors sooner rather than ongoing fluid boluses with no response. And then the SMART trial, which fluid? <laughs> Compared the two, there was really no difference. And then same with the split and the SALT. They were essentially looking at patients that were unwell to go to ICU and those that just stayed in ED because they didn't need ICU. And they compared plasma light versus normal saline um, or Hartman's type fluid, and there was no difference. So it's safe to say that normal saline as is actually okay as a resuscitation fluid in ED. It's also okay to still use. And it's also a very valuable solution because a lot of our antibiotics and blood products can are compatible with it. Um, hemodynamic management. So again, just reiterating crystalloids um, is the first line, nothing like starch or um, gelatin, which was also trialed in the past. And albumin you would consider for those that have had high volume fluids already, or those that have got some chronic liver disease. The first line vasopressor, and this has probably been more of a change recently, is noradrenaline. And this can actually be given through a peripheral line. There was a big push that it had to be through a central line, um, but in that temporizing measure, we can give it through a large cannula in the arm. They recommend adding vasopressin as a second inotrope, uh, sorry, as a, as a second line um, vasopressor rather than increasing your NORAD because it's actually shown to improve outcomes. And um, invasive blood pressure monitoring is recommended for those patients with septic shock and that involves an art line insertion. So MAP, what target MAP do we want? I don't have systolics here because the guidelines actually all talk about MAP, but really we want to initially aim for a MAP greater than 65. And then once we've resuscitated, we can aim for a MAP greater than 60, keeping in mind that we're seeing that there's good signs of end organ perfusion, good urine output, no signs of confusion and um, good cap refill. Those with longstanding hypertension, there was a trial called the sepsis 
um, TAM trial, where they actually saw those with long-standing hypertension, um, do we aim higher? And it showed that there was an improvement in renal function and less likely to need renal replacement therapy. However, they did have an increased risk of AF. Um, so it's kind of, we were discussing earlier, maybe 70, a map of 70 would probably be better and then you're probably balancing both those. So a few other adjuncts you might've heard about, steroids. Steroids are recommended. That's a new addition in the latest guidelines and it's um, 50 milligrams of hydrocortisone. This is for those patients in ICU on um, vasopressor support. So it's not your little old granny with diverticulitis and we'll give her some hydrocort. Um, it's also recommended that you do your DVT prophylaxis, stress also prophylaxis recommended for those with high risk. And the other thing that has changed is no longer doing that tight glucose control. So glucose less than 18 is okay. You might have heard vitamin C um, for septic shock. That is not recommended. Um, and of course, thiamine for our patients at risk. So those that are severely malnourished or um, alcoholics. So back to our old mate. He um, CRP came back a little bit later and it came back at 2.30, which started a knee-jerk reaction to then get our VBG, which showed a lactate of four. This then triggered that this is sepsis or septic shock, given that the blood pressure was low. He was given appropriate antibiotics for community um, sepsis of unclear source. So he was given uh, Gent and Fluflox and was given a 500 fluid bolus. <clears throat> However, there was no improvement and was started on a metaraminol and invasive blood pressure monitoring was started. So the red box just indicates when all this happened. Um, and keeping in mind before that, he was just getting uh, non-invasive blood pressure. And then the outline was popped in at uh, about six o'clock. So it's very easy to say, well, of course it's sepsis when you're looking at it retrospectively. But just taking you to what it is like in the ED, not every patient can go into resus. We only have five beds that are full most of the time. We have significant access block where we have patients waiting a long time to actually get into our bed because we've outgrown our space. We also have um, uh, issues where there are delays with access, there's delays with blood. So I think with this patient, um, the use, oh, I'll talk about that in a little bit, sorry. So strategies to improve timely care in the ED. So our, um, we started an ED sepsis working group probably about a year ago now, or just shy of a year, um, because we realised we need to focus on this because we deal with adults, neonates and peds. So I, uh, we did an audit and just really identified some of the issues and concerns with ED. There are some things we can fix and some things we can't fix. So regarding on how we can improve timely administration to antibiotics, a lot of it is identifying the patient. They don't always get the higher acuity um, score. A lot of our CAT 3s or CAT 4s are the elderly people with vague symptoms. So it's really hard to, to change that because they present vague. A lot of our patients are difficult IV access for chronic comorbidities. It's also hard. A lot of times we wait for bloods to come back before giving antibiotics. And we've also got significant overcrowding, as you all know. Um, and so we thought, how can we improve this? Starting with antibiotics, we um, worked with our amazing pharmacists. So the team consisted of two pharmacists, um, nurses and some doctors, um, and we've standardized all our antibiotic formulas and administration time. And this is so that there is, everything is given at a fixed volume over a fixed time. It was identified that even though some could be given over three to five minutes, doing a slow push is never going to happen despite best intentions just because of time. And so the quickest way we can get antibiotics is through those syringe infusers. And this has been passed through the uh, medication safety of the hospital. So everything's essentially 20 mils in 12 minutes. We've also been doing some um, education around broad spectrum to narrow spectrum antibiotics. And so that when um, you've got difficult access, you've only got one line, you're giving broad spectrum first. Strategies, um, we were hoping to implement this in DHR, but that just wasn't possible based on DHR. So it's essentially a lanyard that all the nurses are carrying around that we've made for that. We've also located all, this all seems really simple, I know, but it's all going to help. Um, put all the antibiotics in one in one drawer in our Pixis machine. Um, We've also um, modified and improved our sepsis care set or our quick order set. Um, I don't know what's called on the wards for sepsis. So it includes all the appropriate investigations and antibiotics as approved by AMS with pre codes already there. Um, and we're also trying to encourage the use of two IVs to be inserted in the setting of septic shock. So both antibiotics can run at the same time. We've also, I guess I'd like to say debunked the theories because always told, oh, you've got to wait half an hour between antibiotic doses and those sorts of things, but actually 
Um, and the big one there is the gentamicin and the flu clocks. You can actually administer them both post a very small flush of 10 mils. Um, ultimately, if you could do it in two lines, that's fine. But in the setting of septic shock with someone with poor access, the one line is okay. So you don't need to wait half an hour. So, um, so we're using September to bring all this education around about those changes. So back to our patient, he ended up spending four days in ICU. He went to the ward and had two more met calls and had ongoing vasopressor support due to a secondary infection. He had 22 days in an acute hospital, 38 days in a rehab. He had multiple complications as a result of his sepsis, the big one being deconditioning. So how could we have done better? I think use of a sepsis screening tool at triage would have helped. Um, he did have a, a rash, so not quite skin with cellulitis, but he still had skin stuff, um, but he had respiratory symptoms. He also had new confusion. He had acute deterioration. He had a recent surgery or procedure with his endoscopy um, and he had altered mental status. So use of a screening tool would help. So our early recognition would lead to early antibiotic administration rather than four hours later. He would have early vasopressor support because he would be in a monitor, appropriately monitored bed, early invasive blood pressure monitoring and early ICU disposition. And this is one thing that does get really hard when we have our patients sitting in recess. And sometimes it's about weaning the vasopressors before going to ICU. Sometimes what these people need is a bit more time on their vasopressor and that happened elsewhere. So we can look after the next septic patient that comes in. So this person was um, 12 hours in our ED. So other things moving forward is we really are working towards implementing a code sepsis in our ED, and that's where we get our ED pharmacists to help administer, draw up and administer the medications. They're, we're working on a package now for them to be trained up on how to give these medications and also help look at the chart to see for any prior micro that's relevant. That means the nurses, instead of them going to get the drugs, they can help with other medications or working with IV access, getting analgesia, all those sorts of things. This has been initiated in the Alfred with good success. Another area is sepsis in the elderly. So this is really important given that we've got an aging population. And we know that one of the big things with sepsis in the elderly is they present with delirium. And this leads to an increased risk of ICU admission, prolonged um, hospital um, stays, uh, long-term cognitive decline and death. So we really probably need to focus our attention on our elderly patients um, for a minute, even though I'm a kid person, but anyway. Um, and so screening is the first step to detection. And that's really trying to focus on those two things that can be really hard to pick up when we just see our patients for a few minutes at a time. And that's the inattention and the fluctuating state. So there's a delirium screening tool that is greater than 90% sensitive for delirium. So it's very simple. You just assess the patient at the end of the bed. Are they alert and calm? yes or no, if there's anything on either side of that, whether that's drowsy or agitated, um, then you wanna go and ask them to spell the word lunch backwards. If it's all fine, we're not worried about delirium, but any of those things, then we need to actually follow it up with another screening tool, which takes less than two minutes. And that's the brief calm. And that's been adapted from the ICU tool that they use. It contains the four cardinal features. So the fluctuating inattention, uh, disorganized thinking, um, and also the altered level state. So it's really important that we identify this because um, it leads, if it's delayed presentation and delayed recognition, it leads to significant outcome, like that gentleman who was 50, uh, 71, the gentleman we spoke about. Another area that um, we as an organization think should happen um, is a sepsis care coordinator. So similar to a trauma care coordinator, um, it's a clinician, um, usually a nurse who comes and helps and gets involved with the care. So they get the code, uh, they come and meet the patient, they assist with all that multidisciplinary consults that need to happen. And then also make sure those important things that I didn't go over, like uh, referral to rehab, referral to physio, all those sorts of things happen, as well as post-hospital discharge. They can also help with um, one area that we're trying to focus on research as well. Um, we'll probably hear a lot more about fluids over the next many years. Um, I think there is increasing awareness not to flood. My teaching was you flood them until they get pulmonary edema and then you drain them, um, which is better than renal replacement therapy. That was a while ago. So, you know, there is increase. Um, will normal saline go away one day? I don't think so, but I'm sure there'll be lots more icy papers about it. Um, and I think it's just really important that we consider the inc incidental fluids with infusions, um, which we have tried to reduce. Um, and then, Summary, sorry, I've been talking for a while, but screening tools, 
we want to get everyone thinking, could it be sepsis? Um, the need for early intervention, so early IV antibiotics saves lives, um, early source control, early hemodynamic optimization, and within ICU in six hours, which I think we should be trying to work together to get that happening. Um, just remember that septic shock is systolic blood pressure less than 90 and lactate greater than four. Um, really think we should be pushing towards a code sepsis. Um, a delirium screening tool is really important in the emergency department, but I think hospital wide, and should this be something that's done in all our patients over 65 on a daily basis? And every time there is a change in a clinical situation, think, could it be sepsis? In particular for your met calls um, on the ward, if people's not quite looking the way they should, or there's been a sudden change, you need to think, could it be sepsis? That's it, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Alison. That's a very comprehensive talk and um, taking us through 20 years very quickly, but I think we have really good understanding of the timing. No, 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 it's good. We've got a really good understanding of where we're up to. Um, so do we have any questions from the audience? Cool. Right. Oh, I wanted to ask a question. Sorry. Yes. So, okay. Ian was happy. Thanks. Um, Highly irregular. Let's all, we'll, we'll let it happen. <laughs> So I just asked Ian from ID to come because I do have a few questions. One thing we do in the ED is we're really impatient and we expect a response straight away. At what stage should we be thinking about broadening our antibiotics in these patients that we see? And so that's part one. And part two is when do you think we should be calling ID? Are they an underutilized service or not, you know, or overutilized? Yeah, that's possible. for those easy questions. Um, I think, I mean, to talk uh, firstly about early identification, I think that's probably the key. Um, and I mean, you touched on a lot of the screen tools there. And getting juniors, I think, as well, as nursing staff to identify and think about sepsis is, is probably the most important um, point. I think um, once uh, you've sort of identified it, a key feature for, I guess, for us thinking about sort of at 48 hours, 72 hours, is actually getting those cultures out. Um, and I agree, getting antibox in very, very early is uh, important, and uh, you know it's encouraging to see the mechanisms that you're doing to put them all in one track and then sort of um, uh, make sure that they're, they're prescribed early. Taking you back to the 71 year old that came in at 12:30 and then got bloods done at 3:30 and then got antibody given at four. Like it's you can see there's three or four hours there at the front end, so which there hasn't been identification, and it's probably hard to know now with the retrospective scope to say why that is the case. Uh, but uh, maybe um, sort of try to build that with education and sort of want to identify sepsis um, would be helpful. Uh, what to do when you give you know your antibiotics for what you think the clinical syndrome is and then getting better in front of you uh, immediately. Um, I don't think uh, at five minutes you reach for uh, numerous antibiotics and give them. Well, we do see that, I guess, uh, sort of like give them maybe, uh, I guess, our anxiety as doctors. And sometimes, you know, we feel like uh, giving five antibiotics is what we need to do in 15 minutes, but you probably need to wait time. And I think that's the important lesson. I think that I've learned over the years with sepsis is time is just so important. So that means going back and looking again and again. And again, with your 71 year old, you see that there was some large chunks of time that the observations weren't done. I think you had a big box over it. And so it wasn't repeated looking. Um, look, if they're not picking up within you know, the hour, two hours, uh, and you're giving your initial antibiotics and you really do sort of resuss them and you know that you, you resuss them and you're thinking, gee, there's just not something going on right here, yeah, uh, we're very happy to be called. We will be you know, happy to be called earlier uh, than later in these cases and sort of advise on you know, what other clinical syndromes it could be or see what their microbiome is reflecting on and see if we need to close some bottles with some other antibiotics as well. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, calls, we're, we're very happy to do that, but probably giving us some time and seeing you know, whether their uh, pressure requirements or you know, their blood pressure is improved or not. Thanks, Ian. Mike just had an additional question, I guess. Fully clocks and gent is a fairly broad spectrum of combination to start off with if you give it the right dose at the right time. I guess, yeah, sorry. Just saying that flu clocks and gent is a pretty broad spectrum antibiotic concoction to start off with. But Ian, what would you say if you knew the person was MRSA positive or colonized or had MROs from their you know, their, their catheter bag, for example, would that change your empiric antibiotics? 
Yeah, thanks. And so that's a really important point. Like you look at their micro dial, you look at what they've got previously, you see if they've got MRSA products, you see if they've got a VRE and it's your sepsis link, and you try and close those holes up front. So you can bank mice if you know they've got MRSA and it's like they've got staph sepsis. Um, you know, if it requires a bit more ice more than lid, um, certainly if they've got MROs from the ESPL, uh, you need to close those holes. Um, one of the biggest emerging threats, uh, the sort of slow pandemic of AMR, is uh, it's going to come here in uh, Canberra. I think we've got probably one of the best you know, community microbiomes you could get uh, to be honest. Like our ESPL rates fairly low. But where I work in Southeast Asia, anywhere between sort of 50 to 60 percent of the organisms in blood are resistant to Chemotraxa. Uh, and so if you have patients that are coming out with those sorts of places and to our hospitals, we need to know about it. And you need to think about you know, um, getting generalised and upfront so then sort of escalating to sort of recover. And if that's, if that's what's happening, we would be very happy to call in those instances if that's, that's what's happening. Um, yeah, then I think you know, the, the key is probably getting all of those cultures. And we recommend just, you know, four bottles of blood cultures if, you know, if you can. And, um, it doesn't necessarily always need to be from two different pools uh, before you give those antibiotics. If if it's a real struggle when they're shut down, then you know from the same pool you can get four bottles out. So two sets is uh, is very helpful for us. for you. Excellent. So do we have any other questions here or online? I might have one question then, Alison. Um, so now on your, one of your early slides, you, uh, in terms of the KPIs for administration of antibiotics, it said one hour for septic shock. Yeah, so a question about timing of antibiotics. So Alison had a slide up saying that for septic shock, uh, KPI is one hour for septic shock and yeah. three hours for sepsis. Yeah. Um, where does that three hours come from? Uh, because we usually talk about the golden hour and giving antibiotics as soon as possible. Um, and is that a guideline driven number? Yeah. Um, so, sorry, microphones. Yeah. So that's come from the surviving sepsis guidelines in 2021, and it's also in the clinical care standard um, because we don't want to just throw antibiotics at everyone and anyone because exactly what Ian said about the um, resistant to the heaps of resistance happening in the community. So it was they're more happy for us to be, I guess, a bit less. Um, gung ho with the antibiotics to make sure nothing else is going on um, and within three hours is okay because from three to five hours I notice worsening mortality in those patients with sepsis but not septic shock. So we're not talking about the septic shock which is those hemodynamically unstable with high lactate. So within three hours and that's what the organisation is um, supporting here. I did have another question for Ian, sorry. I said I was going to say four but I'll just do one more. Um, and I think this is relevant. Um, we're seeing a lot more group A strep recently. Um, and I guess what are some tips and tricks regarding that patient that presents who's just not getting any better? What are some things we should be looking for in the setting of group A strep? Yeah, so basically group A strep, so streptococcus collagen is um, one of the family beta heme streps, um, has had a bit of an epi rise globally, actually. Um, and it's a little bit unknown uh, why that's the case. So they've seen it in the US, they've seen it in the UK, and we've seen it here as well. Um, and so uh, invasive group A strep getting into bloodstreams, giving you sort of septic shock can be a, a bit of a tricky one to pick sometimes. Sometimes they may only come with some pharyngitis and borderline hypotension. Uh, they can have a bit of a rash, um, but it can just be you know, hypotension and feeling very unwell. Um, luckily, streptococcus is a group A strep is exquisitely sensitive to penicillin. Uh, so if you were you know, going through your sepsis protocols, uh, they would meet the criteria for those, um, you know, you're going to cover it um, just on the way through, trying to treat with other things. Um, but we have had a few, even in the last month, end up in ICU, you know, where it was, you know, sort of on the side of what it was, and then all of a sudden, group A strip was found uh, either in their throat or, you know, they sort of sleep in body type. So, yeah, it can be a bit of a tricky one. Um, it's important to keep in the front of your mind. Um, Thank you. I've got Thanks, Ask questions. Uh, oh, here we are. Sorry. Uh, so this is from uh, Hashim Kariyalo. Any evidence for the magnitude of implications of time delay to commencement of antibiotic on outcome? Is it linear or exponential, and why? I have that for our um, ED 
chat later on today, but uh, each delay, so I did have a graph, but not on this presentation, sorry. So each delay, hour and delay to antibiotics increased the mortality by 7.5%. Um, and I can't say whether it's linear or exponential, I apologize. But there is the study that shows 7.5% um, increased mortality with each hour of delay with antibiotics and septic shock. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, and Karina has got a question about um, if going to give antibiotics, they need to take the blood cultures prior to the antibiotics. Yep, yep. Makes sense. Uh, and other issues about empirical fluclox and gentamicin. It's yeah, just to make clear that this is sepsis of unclear source yep. rather than they're fitting some sort of other syndrome. Um, Fluclox and gen is not a good combination for pneumonia, meningitis, or intra-abdominal sepsis, so it's still important to assess the clinical history and examination to, to identify a likely source. So, um, any, any sort of questions or comments about pediatric sepsis? I guess that's... Uh, yeah, so... What, any, so what are we doing in that area, say, within the emergency department that you'd like to tell the group? Yeah, so we're also dealing with pediatric and neonatal, but we haven't been able to get as much movement as we would like in this space because it is a bit more complex. Um, the dosing of antibiotics, we're waiting for a new pump, um, a new pump set to come in. So we haven't been able to standardize those antibiotics and based on the weight of the children and all that sort of stuff. But we have um, been doing education about pediatric um, tool, screening tools. So we're also implementing that. And more in kids than adults is the big push for IM antibiotics. And so we've linked our orders so that they're IV and IM. And so really the education around both doctors and nurses that not getting the line isn't a failure, probably not giving the antibiotics is more of a failure. So to really consider that IM if we can't get IV access. And we're working with NICU to put together um, an appropriate neonatal screening tool. Um, given that our neonates aren't CAT 2s, we need to make sure that we're more diligent with our neonatal kids. Um, and with regards to cultures, we try really hard, but sometimes people are really difficult to get blood from. So sometimes we put them in pediatric blood culture tubes. Sorry, um, Karina, about that. We do try really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we've done standardized antibiotic prescribing under our order set, which the ED are learning about today, because it's finally up for um, education. So everything has been standardized as per AMS with the appropriate dosing time and um, appropriate codes um, for um, clear source, unclear source, allergies and all that sort of stuff. So yes, but pediatric and neonate, a bit more difficult, but um, AMS have put together their recommendations for the antibiotics. So it's in DHR to try to get online now. All right. The um, just a, maybe last last couple of minutes just to talk about uh, the ward. We have uh, we sort of have patients talking about patients coming in through the ED, um, but we have a lot of deteriorating patients on the ward who also have delirium and sepsis. Are there any comments today from registrars or residents in the audience about how do you deal with the recognition of sepsis on the wards? Is that is um, do we need more teaching on that or to make it easier? Or oh, Gautam, you're a ID reg. What, how, what's your comments about? Uh, how we manage sepsis on the wards. You might need a microphone actually, Gautam. Because we don't have the packs there, it's, you know, similar to what you have, have here. We don't um, necessarily have it all laid out for, for our resident doctors to um, acutely, they have to still have to go collect everything to do the blood cultures and the, um, and I wonder whether the similar sort of thing in terms of recognition of the, the delirium and could this be sepsis should be rolled out onto the wards as well. But, Adam, what are your thoughts? I suspect it's a lot easier to triage and manage sepsis on the wards. Was because usually the symptom is either starting to become a little clearer and there's a trajectory where the person's responding that like, it's or not. So, depending on escalation versus uh, escalation ICU staying back in the ward itself, uh, it, it does help a lot in terms of decision making with empty priorities. And it would be a lot more difficult to have to the waste department, it's just so differentiated. Uh, on the flip side of that, there's the uh, aspect of uh, very uh, non specific symptoms like delirium that can be ossified as uh, infection or not. And that would be a challenge, I guess, in the future going forward in terms of uh, 
That does come down a little bit to the time that you get to sit down and actually go with each patient. Yes, and especially if patients have a lot of more time for so many weeks and sometimes months as well. You go to absolute and um, so many roles, so much investigation information that the patient becomes a little bit clear. Yeah. So, just to summarize that, I think, I think it is a little bit easier to do try and make decisions based on the syndrome that we are looking at. But, um, the biggest challenge in that particular aspect, I think, is so it's having the time to sit down and actually understand yeah, what are we going on, what are we playing a role here. Does that make sense? Yep. Thanks, Gatton. Is there another comment at the back there? Let me pass the. Um, I was just going to say, is it a generic resident? Response um, and doing a lot of after hours, we don't know the patients very well. You haven't been part of their care, but um, I think a fever is a major response to a septic strain. There's no other previous history, but things like hypertension um, certainly aren't. Um, I don't think that would ever be our first response to think that maybe this is septus. I would hope that septic shock isn't necessarily the first time you're meeting someone. Um, in on the boards, I think it's more that um, uh, not the shock part, but the septic, but the patient having a new infection that's um, septic, and so you still have that, I guess, three hours. But in terms of a, a guideline or a, a routine, I think that that's something that's actually you've, I've created over two years of experience and taking on for other people as opposed to it being sort of set out quite clearly. Um, whether that's something to look into or whether it already exists in that environment. Yeah, look, look, I think it's a, a good point that some studies show up to a third of say, general medical patients are delirious at any one time. And understanding that, um, you know, sepsis is a driver of much of that. And how, when you don't know, if you're a resident overnight, you might not know the patient that you're seeing. You don't know if they're normally delirious, what their cognition is like. And often it's the change over time that is the definition of a fluctuating state. So. I think probably we need to do a bit of more education about recognizing the atypical or the less um, prominent symptoms of sepsis. So if they're febrile and rigoring, that's one thing. But if they're a bit off, a bit delirious, um, hypothermic, um, or a bit tachycardic, then you know, sep thinking of sepsis and doing the appropriate at least cultures would be important. Yeah, and then the other comment on that is the nightmare that he is getting access to the That's a really good point about going up the priority list. Um, Sam? Just a really quick one, I'll say it really loudly. But Paul, Paul can't hear, so we just need to. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting, yes, maybe we get a microphone. So, Sam? <laughs> yeah. I can hear you. Um, Ian alluded to it. I wonder if we could just standardize that cultures don't need multiple punctures. It's really the volume more than multiple punctures outside of those places where we're worried about um, endocarditis and particularly the cell acute, but particularly for this sort of water patient and for the ED overall patient, that it's really about getting volumes. If you get the volume, get the four bottles, you've done the job, let's get the end points in rather than putting pressure on if you've had a multiple gas. I'm sure how any of you support that as a standard approach. <laughs> so, we might get a comment from Ian first and then to Drew. Never wait for your career. It's fun as well. Um, uh, I, I think you know you're not going to be able to get an unsaid demo. It, it, it's, it's the 40 mils that you want, uh, and uh, in endocarditis from 60 mils, it just increases your sensitivity. 
the issue comes obviously if you pull that through and then step it in your bottles. Is that significant or not? But um, I think it all good can be done by collecting the four what I've seen so far. Um, they're not collecting them um, and you know, trying to stab around with my better this the second time. Thanks, Rick. Yes. yes uh, just a follow up to AD procedures in that regard. A previous generation of uh, microbiologists insisted that given the high contamination rates of black bodies in the AD, there was no point in doing them unless the patient was actually febrile at the time. No, you're not, not going to buy that one. I mean, of course, of course, yeah, it's just maybe blood conscious, yeah. And and so not everyone, you know, um, this factor really, you know, this five hundred people right in front of you. So if you're thinking you're dealing with that, you've got to get those conscious before you do a full spectrum of Expect to see our contamination rates rising. No, no, because all the sterile stuffs in the trolley. <laughs> So I think we can do both things well. We can do it uh, in a sterile way, but also get out the right volume of blood. Um, Karina has commented that we also need to collect via vacutainer rather than syringe. So the vacutainer system will help with volume. That's actually a really, sorry, just to jump in. That's a really uh, sort of practical point because if you're collecting the syringe and mixing it all around and then you're sticking it in four bottles, you're just contaminating it's all four bottles. Yeah. So the reason you do it for a vacutainer is the first little bottle that's got the staff at you from your skin goes into your first bottle, and then obviously that's um, sort of thrown away, and you know, second, third, fourth bottle gives you the result. Again, Karina's uh, comment is no evidence that it matters whether they have fever or not. If you give, if you're going to give antibiotics, and just just take the blood culture first. I think that's a good principle. All right. Any last gasp questions on World Sepsis Day? Um, there are no more questions online. So just like to thank Alison Lally um, for presenting today. So very comprehensive and, and timely. And I think you'll be invited to maybe speak to some junior groups as well um, in, in the future. Okay. Thank, so you. thank you. Thanks, everyone.